Okay, we'll uh, begin after the break. Uh, we're just looking at uh, the second section in which we have divided uh, the book of Acts. The second se section is the next 10 years where we see how the revival fire is uh, spreading. So uh, we looked at um, three things that happened, okay? Uh, the first thing is we need to raise up believers who are strong in the word and the spirit who can take, uh, you know, the revival fire or the gospel to others. Second one is we need to be willing to uh, believe God and move with him even as he opens doors, okay? It's not that when revival happens, we just stay in that place and enjoy it, but we take the revival fire. And uh, the third thing is uh, even when we face persecution, we need to be able to trust God, okay? Because God works even those challenging times, <clears throat> those difficult times, he works. And uh, we see how the uh, revival spread so massively in spite of the uh, persecution that happened. Okay? And also we see... Um, um, how people in leadership are coming into, um, uh, you know, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we see how God dealt with the apostles when they were thrown into prison. He was, they were set free. And we see how God uh, deals with King Herod, right? King Herod was, um, uh, who started his persecution was also dead, okay? Now, during this 10-year uh, period, an important feature in this 10-year period is we see Luke being mentioned, okay? Uh, basically, um, the, the, in Acts chapter 8 to 13 is the next 10 years that we are studying about. We see um, Luke being mentioned here. He's somebody who's working along with Paul, okay? Um, uh, and we see that uh, he helps Paul in his ministry, okay, and the work that is being done. We do not know much about Luke, how he came to faith, uh, you know, where he came to faith, we do not know. Maybe he would have been part of the original converts at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached his uh, message. Or he might be part of uh, Paul's home church that is in Antioch in Syria. Okay, because Luke was from Antioch. Okay, so um, when Paul might have, you know, gone there, he would have met Paul. Maybe he would have converted. We don't know anything, but we know that Luke was very much part of Paul's ministry and was with Paul till the very end. Okay, um, and in these ten years that we're seeing, the second section of uh, Acts chapter eight, uh, we also see um, that Paul's work, uh, how it begins. Um, uh, we see how an individual can start carry that revival fire to other places. So Paul, as an individual, he took that revival to other nations and cities as uh, well. So we read this in Acts chapter thirteen to chapter twenty-eight which covers the next 20 years of the church, okay? Uh, so we're going to be covering the now the next 20 years, which is the last section of what how we are studying the book of um, Acts, okay? So there's a lot that is uh, going on uh, in Paul's life. There's a lot that we'll have to cover about Paul's life, but uh, we'll just start with some of the main points that we see in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, what do we see? Or what do we read in Acts chapter 9? Yes, Paul's conversion. Okay, so Paul is uh, from uh, coming from which place to which place? Acts chapter 9? Jerusalem to Damascus, yes. And what is happening then? So he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus. And then he goes to Damascus and we know how, uh, uh, you know, um, God raises up, um, you know, um, uh, Ananias, Ananias to go and, um, you know, speak to um, Paul and, uh, you know, lay hands on him and how he is able to see and also baptize in the, in the water and baptize in the Holy Spirit as 
well. Okay. And so we see that Paul starts ministering there itself in Damascus. Okay. He's preaching. Uh, you like to put up that last, uh, last map, please? Yeah. That last map, which we already saw, but we'll just go through it once again. Yeah. So we see Paul uh, going from Jerusalem to uh, Damascus. Okay. And then um, we see that, you know, he's preaching there in Damascus. And from there, he goes to Arabia. So if you look right down on your screen, bottom of your screen on the right hand side is Arabia, that is number four. And then he preaches there for some time. And then he goes back to Damascus. For the rest of those three years, he spends three three whole years there uh, preaching all this time to the Jews because he's going to synagogue and the synagogues only Jews come. So he's preaching there. And then the people try to arrest him. But he escapes from Damascus and goes to Jerusalem for 15 days. Okay, Even when he's in Jerusalem there, he's, it's the first time that he is going to meet all of these apostles. Right Before that, he, has, he was a persecutor. Okay, and so I'm sure all apostles are very scared of him, but now he is getting introduced to the apostle uh, Peter and James. James was a leader of the church as well. Okay, and who introduces him? Barnabas. Okay, Barnabas uh, introduces him um, to the uh, uh, to the apostles there. So we know that during this time also there was Barnabas. Um, uh, Agabus, who was also a prophet, and uh, all of them were and leaders, and Simon were also leaders in the church at Jerusalem. But we see how they go out and also uh, share the gospel. Yes. Remember, during uh, Jesus' time when he was doing the ministry, uh, uh, there was no encounter of uh, Saul with Jesus, or uh, uh, he saw Jesus during the persecution, during the march to the cross. There's nothing, nothing of record, anything. Oh, you're saying did Paul see? Uh, did yeah. he know? But then Saul, who became Paul, oh, yeah, Saul, okay. Saul who became Paul. So during when Jesus was there here, so that time there was uh, nothing that's recorded in the Bible that he was there. He met. No, he saw. He spoke. Recorded. Nothing. Yeah, there's nothing recorded. Because in some uh, uh, Christian movies we see a Roman soldier, but it's like it's not told it is Saul or Paul. Or, he was not a Roman soldier. Okay, okay. Paul. Yeah. He was, uh, of course, he was a Pharisee. Sorry? First encounter is only at Road to Damascus. Before that, there was no encounter with Jesus. But he had known uh, uh, Jesus and all. That's why he was persecuting the, uh, the, the people who were believing in, in Jesus, right? So, and he was also a very learned man. So he was hearing all of their, uh, what they were saying and what they were teaching and preaching. He would have heard about it. But he was a very zealous Jew, Pharisee. Yeah, so he was quite contending for his own uh, Jewish race and Jewish people. And maybe because there were more converts among the Jews, that was something that was threatening Judaism. So maybe he was so zealous for that. Yeah, but we don't know anytime, anything about him or hear anything about him during Jesus' time. Sorry? Yes, yes. Saul, so Saul, why are you persecuting The first me? words of... Uh, yes, Jesus. yeah. So he understood, uh, you know, Jesus, Jesus or Jesus' voice. Maybe he would have known. We don't know. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, during this time, we see when 15 days when Paul was in, uh, or Saul was in Jerusalem, he meets uh, Peter and James. He was introduced to them by Barnabas. Okay. And during this time, also, he goes to synagogues and he preaches to the Jews. And the Jews are very, very angry okay how can this man who was a zealous jew you know all out to persecute the christians he is now teaching the same faith he's teaching about the same man he was persecuting that is jesus so they will his life was at risk the disciples came to know about it and then they slowly take him away to uh, caesarea okay um, and then we see from caesarea which is number seven uh, on the board on the sea coast of the mediterranean sea from there, they travel to Paul travels to um, his uh, home that is in Tarsus, right up uh, number nine. There he goes to Tarsus, and then we see that uh, Paul, you know, um, 
uh, goes to um, uh, the church at Antioch, which is in uh, Syria. Okay, so we do not know what happened just before his first missionary journey. After he leaves Jerusalem, goes to Syria, and then he goes to Caesarea, and then he goes to uh, uh, his hometown in um, Tarsus. We do not know much about Paul for those uh, six to ten years of his life. So six to ten years of life of his life, nothing much is recorded about Paul. Apart from yes, he preaching and teaching here and there, and he receiving a lot of revelations okay uh, which is something that but he doesn't do much missionary work at that time but of course he's preaching and teaching but he receives a lot of revelation which is known as the silent years of paul's life so six to ten years and then we see that um, you know then after that we he starts his first missionary journey okay so when paul was in tarsus you know and uh, barnabas was in antioch in syria if you look at your map the border of the sea coast point 10 uh, number 10 you know where that is where the and church at antioch was in in syria uh, you know barnabas was there he needed assistance he needed help so he goes all the way to tarsus and asks paul and he brings him to the church at antioch and they served together for about a year there okay and um, Paul is ministering there, but we do not know anything much. Okay. Now, even as we are going to be studying about 20 years of Paul's life and his missionary um, journeys and what he has done, I want you to keep this in mind. Okay. Uh, yes, Paul uh, was an apostle. He was also a church leader. But we are looking at him in this study. We are looking at him more in the sense of how he is as a single person carry that revival fire okay so it's not that we're not giving importance to his apostleship or his leadership in the church but no we are looking at more as as an individual paul as an individual a person who's called by god and how he affected the revival how he carried that revival to other places so that is uh, our focus and that is what we are going to be looking at even as we study all that Paul accomplished during his missionary journey. Okay, all of you with me? Yes, any questions so far? Anyone likes to ask any questions? No questions? Okay. Online students, no question? Okay, there are no questions. We will start with Paul's missionary journey, AD 44 to 46. Okay. Uh, and uh, it you can, no need, we can, yeah. So span of two or three years, we see is covered in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, to Acts chapter 14, verse 28. So we look at a certain uh, few verses from Acts chapter 13. So please, all of you turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13, um, Acts chapter 13, verse 1, we look up till Acts 14, 28, okay? So as we read these passages, we look at all the places that he went to, okay? Now, where was Paul's home church? Paul's home church? At Antioch in Syria. Yes. Antioch in Syria. Thank you, Lucy. Yes, it was Antioch in um, Syria. Like I said, there is one more Antioch in Pisidia. We're looking at both of these places, but it is Antioch in Syria. Okay. Uh, so when we look at Paul's first missionary journey, uh, you know, he started his missionary journey from Antioch in um, Syria, and then he comes back to Antioch in um, Syria. No, you don't have to present this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, in your, if in you look at your uh, uh, textbooks, okay, on page number 13, um, it's a little bit about Antioch in Syria as mentioned there. I'm not going to look at all the uh, good, important, prominent features about Antioch. Uh, but just to mention uh, a few things here is that, uh, you know, it was established in 301 BC, 300 years before Christ. 
It was not north of Jerusalem, okay, near the near the sea coast. It's actually a very big city. It is, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was as big as cities as Rome and Alexandria, and it's even bigger than Jerusalem. Uh, we uh, see that there are almost five hundred thousand people living in Antioch. Okay, but when we looked at Jerusalem, you know, there were only hundred thousand people living there here this is five times more the size of uh, jerusalem okay so it's one of the biggest cities and if you look at page number 13 uh, there are various features the first paragraph uh, you can read about the whole city of um, um, antioch that is in syria okay but i'm not going to be mentioning the details okay you can read that later as well let's move on to acts chapter 13 Okay, we'll be reading a few scripture passages to kind of look at some of the things that Paul's uh, first missionary journey entailed. So okay, if uh, you all open to Acts chapter 13, please. And um, we read Acts chapter 13, verse 1, right? If you look in your Bibles, there was a good leadership uh, uh, team that was raised up at Antioch. Okay, now if you look at Acts chapter 1, there's something very interesting. Can you tell me what is interesting there? Anyone can tell me what is interesting in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. It's talking about the leadership of the church at Antioch, but what is interesting? They prayed and released Paul and Barnabas to church. Sorry, Andrew, can you repeat that again, please? The church prayed and released Paul and Barnabas. Okay, the church prayed and released Paul and Barnabas, fine. Before that, I was looking at uh, the first, yeah, they're different names, okay. Okay, so what do we understand from those names? How many men are mentioned there? Five men, they're prophets and teachers and leaders, right? And what do we understand from their names? The leadership with the church and Antioch was a very diverse mix of people uh, from different social backgrounds, cultural, ethnic uh, backgrounds, a mix of people who were there. Okay, so we see uh, Barnabas who was a Levite from Cyprus. Okay. He was uh, trained and raised up as a leader in the church at Jerusalem. We read about him in Acts chapter 4, 36 and 37. Simon has a nickname Nigger. Nigger means the black. Okay. Uh, like the, uh, okay, so it's a very derogatory term. We don't use that anymore. But, you know, it's unclear whether he was an African or just because he had dark skin, they used to call him Nigger. Okay. Uh, so, but his name Simeon basically mentions that or refers to as a Jewish name. Okay, so we think that he's more Jewish and the dark skin. Then we see Lucius from Cyrene, which is modern day Libya, uh, North Africa. Okay, and he's also possibly a Gentile believer. Okay, um, and then um, uh, who, you know, he was part of. Um, uh, the Cyrenian group from Jerusalem, and he first preached the gospel to the Gentiles at, uh, who first preached the gospel to the Gentiles at Antioch. Okay. Then Manin, which means comforter, uh, who was, uh, you know, they say he was brought up by Herod the Tetrarch, who brought about the persecution. We read about him in Acts chapter, this 13 verse 1. Okay. We, we read about Herod also in the gospels. But Menian must have been raised up in the in the royal court, maybe as a companion of um, you know uh, to Herod or like a foster brother. You know we do not know, um, but he was uh, you know um, uh, a Jew, okay, a Levite. Uh, you know possibly also maybe they say that. Um, Yeah, sorry.
Yeah, so a Levite, a Jew, a possible Gentile believer from Africa, a man brought up in royalty, uh, and Saul, a highly educated Pharisee, made up this very uh, diverse leadership team at, at the church at Antioch. Okay, so what do we learn from this? What do we learn from this? Uh, Yes, go ahead, Sister, Sister Gret Gertrude. Yeah, the leadership was very much diverse, not from one uh, uh, tribe only, but from different places. Okay, so, yeah. Thank you. So we can't think like that, uh, that the one whom I know that God will miss from, like, uh, God will use different people. Okay. So we don't have to think like uh, the people whom I know only, I can take, them only for uh, as a leader and going with them so god can bring unknown means okay yeah. thank you so here we see that uh, even gentiles group from jerusalem that first preached the gospel to the gentiles at antioch okay so we see that even um, you know it's not necessary that the early church had had comprised of leaders who are only jews but god can use even the Gentiles. God can use people from every uh, race, every nation, every ethnic group. And also we need to see that during revival, there is people from different ethnic groups, cultural groups coming together, but they can work together in unity and harmony. Okay. So we need to be open, you know, not have a church where only it's our own people, people from uh, who speak our language, from our country, from our tribe, Okay, but also be open to God raising up leaders from uh, other uh, uh, groups as well, or ethnic groups as well. Okay, all of you with me? Yes, okay. So in verse 2 uh, of uh, Acts chapter 13, can somebody read that? Can somebody read Acts chapter 13, verse 2? While they yes, were... Then. Go ahead, go ahead. While they, they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Amen. So here we see that what were the leaders doing? Yes, they were worshipping God, praying and they were fasting and while they were doing that the holy spirit revealed to them to set apart barnabas and saul or paul for the work of uh, uh, missions okay for the missionary journey so that is an another important part of revival we see where the leadership is uh, in that place of continued prayer and fasting and waiting on the lord why is it important to be in that place of fasting praying and waiting on the lord Preparing for yourself, okay? Yes, you're waiting for direction. You're waiting for the next move. We don't think that, you know, only this revival that is birthed now is going to be here forever, right? We need to see what is the next move of God. Because what is the next season and what God wants to do in the next season? What is he birthing in the next season? That's very important. God works in times and seasons and it's important for us to know what he is wanting to do in the next season maybe there was a revival yes but how do you want to move the revival how do you want to take this uh, revival forward so that is very important and that is what the leadership was doing so that is what we need to do as leaders as well constantly you know uh, don't think okay my church has um, grown you know we are doing a lot of mission work evangelism work you know, very good, but we need to always be engaged and hearing from God to know what is his next move for the church. Others, what happens if we don't do that? Can we go ahead of God in the wrong direction? Yes. We keep limit ourselves. We limit ourselves, okay. What else happens? Yes, thank you, Daniel. We'll become, we'll become stagnated, right? When there is stagnation, what happens? There's no growth. 
and we will be uh, uh, you know what happens when stagnant water is there it will breed a lot of it stinks it breeds a lot of uh, in uh, insects okay which is which ki kind of causes a lot of confusion okay so that is what we're saying so it's important that uh, we see what god is thinking what he's revealing to us what is his next move so that we can move with the things of the holy spirit okay so we see that paul and barnabas they set out on their first missionary journey and it lasted how many years two years and they almost traveled 1200 miles okay so let's read from acts um, chapter 13 verses 4 can somebody read from verses 4 to 12 please acts 13 4 to 12 the two of them sent on their way by the holy spirit went down to seleucia and sailed from there to cyprus when they arrived at salamis they proclaimed the word of god in the jewish synagogues John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Papos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind. And for a time, you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. From Papus, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John Matthew left them. 12. Verse 12. Yeah. So here we, um, I'm not going to explain this because it's very self explanatory. So, which are some of the places that uh, Paul and Barnabas travel to? First, they go to, from Antioch, they travel to Seleucia, which is a seaport town. We are on page number 14 of your textbook as well. You can look at it. Then, from Seleucia, where did they sail to? Uh, to Salamis on the island of Cyprus, okay, um, and uh, Salamis is the largest city of Cyprus on the east coast of the island. Okay, so Cyprus was Barnabas's home country, and they minister. Uh, where did they minister? Basically, in these places, in the synagogues. Okay, so basically, they were ministering to the to the Jews. So sometimes they were traveling on land. Sometimes they were traveling on. Uh, water, okay, the sea, sea routes, okay. Then from Salamis, they traveled on land um, and they traveled to which place? Pamphos, yes, which is the capital of uh, Cyprus, okay. And there we see an interesting uh, episode that happens there where they minister to Sergius Paulus, um, who was the deputy of the country there and he believed in the gospel. Now, how did the um, so what do we learn from this? This inf incident that happens in Paphos. What do we, what can we learn? Acts chapter 4, verses uh, 6 onwards. What do we learn from this? Sergus Paulus was whom? Yeah, deputy of a country, and he was also a very intelligent man. Okay. So the gospel is not just for, yeah, I mean, to the, you know, the people who will easily accept, you know, anything that is said to them, but also the intelligent. Okay. 
those who are studying other religions, those who are studying philosophy, they're also interested and they would also be interested in listening to the gospel and we can also minister to them. So we see that this man had a, who had a great influence on him? Who had a great influence on Sergis Paulus before Paul? Yeah, the sorcerer, right? Elimis, the sorcerer, had a great impact on him, okay? But uh, he was influencing him, and then we see how Paul, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, looked at him and what he said. And then what happens? He becomes blind. Paul says you'll become blind. And what really caused uh, this Paulus to believe? Come on, look at your Bibles. Don't look at me. What does it say? Look at your Bibles. Acts chapter four, uh, 13, verses, verse 12. What causes Sergius Paulus to uh, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? The manifestation of God's works, yes. How he was uh, blinded, yeah. And then what else? Yeah, tell me, Asapu, what's there? Hello, everyone, verse 12, Acts chapter 13, verse 12, Vimal. He was astonished by the miracle. Okay, only miracles? The teaching. And the teaching, it says teaching, there in verse yeah. 12, the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So two things. That's what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? How did people accept? Science, science miracles. miracles. His teaching was accompanied by science miracles and wonders. wonders. What about the early apostles, the early church? They also did. How did people believe? Science miracles. Their wonders. teaching and preaching was attested by science miracles and wonders. So is, is uh, God interested in doing that even today in our midst? Yes, he's the same, Jesus. And we also studied in the kingdom of God that he is a wonderful, he's wonderful counselor, right? Wonderful means miraculous. He wants his kingdom to be filled with the miraculous. So you can even say, God, you know, even as I go out as a missionary, evangelist, pastor, whoever you're calling or whatever your calling is, or in the business world, the calling is to share the gospel. I want my teaching to be attested by signs, miracles, and wonders so that people can believe. Okay. It's referring to Apostle John only, no? Sorry? Um, verse 4, 5. John was with them as their helper, referring to Apostle John only. They also had John as their helper. assistant, John Mark. Okay. Yeah. So uh, here we see that in revivals, signs, miracles, and wonders also accompany preaching of the gospel. But it's not just characteristic in revival. It can also happen in our everyday to day life. Okay. So what do they do from Pamphos? Where do they go? Look at your textbooks, everybody. Page number 14. Where do they go from Pamphos? Perga. Perga in Pamphylia. in Pamphylia. Okay. And then what happens? John Mark went back to Jerusalem. Who's John Mark? He's related to? Barnabas, okay, he's the cousin of Barnabas. Uh, yes, thank you, Andrew. So here we see that um, uh, he joins them, but I think he got, gets tired with all the hard work. Maybe we don't know what happens, what's the reason, but he wanted to go back home. So he leaves them and he goes. And then from Perga, what happens? They travel on and land and they go to? Antioch. Antioch. In, Which Antioch? In Syria. In Pisidia, not Antioch in Syria, from Syria. where they started their journey. Okay. Um, and we have a record of Paul's message at Antioch. So can somebody please read Acts chapter 13 to verse 16, please? So we're not going. Yeah, Acts chapter 13, verses 13 to 16. Yes, please. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to 
Perga in Pamphylia and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. Yeah, amen. Thank you, uh, Lucy. So here we see that when they go, where are they in each town and city when they're going? Where do they go and minister? In the synagogues, okay? So they're not losing out any opportunity. They're ministering. And then what happens in the synagogue? They're reading um, uh, from the law and the prophets. And the rulers ask them if they want to share a word. And what does Paul do? He starts sharing the history um, with what God had revealed to the people of Israel. And from there, he can what he had revealed to them about Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to share about uh, Jesus Christ, okay, uh, and his gospel and what he had done. So all the way from verse 16 to verse uh, 40, well, 1, okay. So can somebody read from verses 42 to uh, verse 52, please? As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, Many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored, and word, honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. 252. Yeah, 52. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So here we see that uh, many people believed in the gospel. And they were so eager to hear the word. And because many started following Paul and Barnabas, and they were so eager to hear the word, and many were accepting the gospel, what did what happened to the, some of the Jews there? They were very jealous. They were filled with envy. But they did not realize that this is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that is moving. Okay? Um, so that is how what and that is what happens when there is a revival or when the revival fire is spreading even through one person you know uh, people will just come flocking from all over people will be attracted to listen to this person people will be attracted to uh, to hear the message they will so desirous to know more because they said hey come, keep coming back right we want you to come back to synagogue uh, next sunday so you see that you know uh, it was such a desire, and we see that desire was not a human effort. We see that God is doing something in the hearts of these people. He was just drawing these people, um, and they were coming to the gathering, and they were just willing to listen to Paul. So this is what happens in revival. In revival, we said we don't have to go run around and advertise and beg people to come, you know, they will just come because they desire it. They, there's a birthing inside them. There is a stirring inside them. Okay. So we see that uh, God is moving in the Holy Spirit is moving in a mighty way. And, um, but Paul and Barnabas are asked to leave. Okay. But in the process, what happens? The, the gospel is open to the 
hospital is open to the Gentiles in these areas. Okay, so that's what Paul says, right? He says, "Hey, you uh, Jews have rejected the gospel." Okay, and so now the we turn to the Gentiles, verse forty-six of chapter thirteen. Okay, you have rejected, and now the gospel is being taken to the Gentiles. And how do the Gentiles respond? Gladly, they receive the gospel with gratitude, and they receive the message. Okay, then from Antioch of Pisidia, Paul and Barnabas travel sixty miles east to which place? Capital of province of Le Iconium. Okay, look at your books, page number fourteen. Um, and this is a city, uh, you know, surrounded by high walls. They spend some time in Iconium. They speak boldly the word of the Lord. They bear witness um, to His word of grace, and they also do mighty signs, miracles, and wonders. That we read in Acts chapter fourteen, verse three. Okay. And then from Iconium, they travel 18 miles to Lystra, okay? And Lystra, they meet a crippled man who was lame from birth, and he was healed. And when he was healed, what do the crowds do? Look at Acts chapter 14, verse 12. Acts chapter 14, verse 12. What happens? Huh? They said that the... They said that Jews and uh, Zeus and Hermes have come down. The no. gods have come down from heaven. So the Barnabas they call as Zeus and Paul Hermes. Okay, and um, uh, and Paul restrained them and he preached the word to them. They wanted to worship them as God and make sacrifices, but Paul restrained them. Um, but we see that the Jews from Antioch in Pisidia, who were very angry with uh, Paul and Barnabas, who asked them to leave, and the Jews from Iconium, when they heard all the things that Paul was doing in Lystra, they come, they stir up the crowd. We read that in Acts chapter 14. And Paul is stoned and dragged out of the city. Okay? Um, so that is in Acts chapter 14. Okay, um, so look at um, Acts chapter 14, verse um, 19 to 24. Can somebody read that, please? Acts chapter 14, verses 19 to 25. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, th thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he had Barnabas left for Derb. They preached the good news in, the, in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Okay, we'll stop there. So what is amazing about this few verses? Now, everybody look into your Bibles, please. Look at Acts chapter 14, verses 19 to 21, and tell me what is amazing. Can you please pass on the mic and please speak into the mics, please? They stoned and dragged the Paul till he was alive till next day. Okay, they stoned Paul and they dragged him out of the city thinking that he was dead. Okay? They thought he's dead. So when you stone somebody, it's not something easy, right? Yes or no? Yeah. So, and I think Paul was really badly hurt. And so they uh, drag him outside the city. And then what happens? What, do you, what does Paul do? Yeah. What does he do? He rose up and went into the city. Is that possible? When you're stoned and you're dragged, you're pulled out. I'm sure that in those days there were no... They did not have like this uh, tar roads and all that. You know, they would have had very rugged, stony roads. Some places maybe good roads, but mostly it was desert and stony roads. And so they were. He was dragged. But what happened, Paul? What does Paul do? They leave him for dead. There, the disciples come. But Paul, what does he do? He rose up and went into the 
city. Maybe he's walked back into the city, right? Would you be able to walk back into the city when you are stoned and dragged like that? No. And what happens? What is the other amazing thing that happens? Look into your Bible. Tell me. And the next the day? gospel and made disciples. What does he do the next day? He preached the gospel to the yeah. city he, and made disciples. Yes. He, he left that city. Okay. He left um, the city and then he goes to Derby. Now, is it possible when you are stoned, you are left for dead, that you can travel the next day and then you travel itself? You know, traveling in those days, it's not by car or bus, it'll come and pick you up your doorstep. You have to walk, right? Or use animals as a, meat of, um, a medium for travel. He must have walked, but he goes to the next city and then he starts preaching the gospel. If you and I were there, what would have happened? Huh? We would have been admitted in a hospital and we would have been um, at least having two or three months to recoup, right? Back to normal health. So don't you think this is amazing? Yes, this is actually a big miracle, right? This is a sign, this is a miracle that happens, okay? And so we see that in the time of revival, we can see this unusual signs, miracles, and wonders. And that's why Jesus says, you can do greater things than what I have done. Some people keep on asking this question, what is the greater? This can be the greater, right? Greater signs and miracles when, I'm sure some of us, you know, even when we have a sports day or we travel somewhere, whether we're sitting in the plane or the train or the car, or we're driving from one city to another city, you know, we're so exhausted by the end of it, right? We just, we, we come back home, we're so, or we reach the destination, we just can't do anything. Just want to eat and sleep, or sometimes not even eat, just, just crash, right? But here Paul gets up the next day, goes to Derby, yes, he preaches the gospel, and he makes many disciples. Is that possible? Humanly, no. In our understanding, no, but we see what God does mightily there okay so he travels to derby which is another 20 miles by land and then um actually the the cities of iconium derby and lystra are part of galatia in the region of galatia okay and it was um, possible that during this time that paul was attacked by some sickness that he later writes about in galatians chapter 4 verses 13 and 14 okay and then from derby where he does a good uh, ministry, okay, we see that he travels back to, where does he go back to? Where does he go back to? Look at your Bibles. Lystra. Yeah, he goes back to Lystra, Iconium. Yes, he goes back to Iconium, Lystra and Antioch. Now, what does it tell you? And it says he went back to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch in Persidia. What does it tell us? Yeah, he strengthens the disciples. But what does it tell us about Paul? What because happened? he was not scared to go back. Yes, thank you, Sister Gertrude. He was not scared to go back. In these places, Iconium, Lystra, and Antioch, where the persecutions, right? They came from Antioch and... Uh, Iconium, they'd come down to, uh, you know, to uh, Lystra and they got people to beat up Paul and left him for dead. Don't you think people who saw him would have been astonished? They thought he was dead. And I think many people just looking at Paul would have also accepted Christ, yes, because they saw the miraculous work of God. So they were not afraid of persecution. Yes, he was bold. He went back. And that is what revival, another feature of revival. People are not scared. They are on fire for God. They go back and they know that there is God's protection and he does protect. Okay. We'll stop here. Any questions? No questions? Ma'am, is there any possibility yeah. that the disciples around the pole would have prayed for him to come back to life? Maybe, because we said the disciples surrounded him, but doesn't say they prayed. If they prayed, they would have mentioned, but Paul just gets up. 
So just a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit and, and God, yes. So we can believe God to do such miracles, even when we go through persecutions. Amen? So God who does that. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining class. Uh, have a good day ahead. God bless. Thank you.